Okay, hello everyone. Let's get started. Uh, my name is Carter, um, and as Morton mentioned yesterday, uh, I'm a relatively new employee at Dialog. My, my background is from physics, so I joined not long after doing my PhD. I've been here for about a year and a half, and today I'm going to talk about some of the performance-related work that I've been doing on the interpreter. So, in particular, um, performance-related improvements in the set uh, primitives. So I'm talking about membership index of union intersection differ. Right now, before we begin, it's three o'clock, uh, almost at the end of a long two days. Uh, I know we're all dreading John's talk coming up after his first two <laughs> um, I will try to um, avoid quite a lot of the details, but if you are interested, ask some questions afterwards or come see me afterwards. All right, let's begin. Uh, as always, we'll begin with some obvious statements. Performance is clearly an important aspect of the interpreter, and as such, over the years, it's accumulated quite a few performance enhancements. Into this also comes Dialogue 18.0, which itself introduced lots of really important, significant performance enhancements. So, by Dialogue 18.0, the state of affairs looks something like this. So, this is a membership at the top here and index over the bottom. Now, don't dwell on this too much. The only thing you should take away from this is that how the interpreter chooses to execute any given expression is not a simple function of its inputs. Right, now, given all of that, we've got some important questions to ask. Because the interpreter has been accumulating performance enhancements over the years, one of the most important questions we have to, answer, have to ask is, what does the performance profile of any particular primitive look like? Now, by performance profile, I mean, given inputs to any particular primitive, how long does that primitive take to execute that expression? And how does that vary as we vary the inputs to that primitive? Related to that is also this question. As you saw in the previous slide, there's lots of different algorithms that are called at any particular, for any particular input. We have to make choices where those algorithms choose to kick in. And there are certain assumptions that underlie those choices. So another, point in another important question that we have to ask is, are the assumptions of the past still valid today? And finally, also importantly, the, the input space to any particular primitive is enormous. By input space, I mean anything, any expression that the primitive can handle. And it's very important that we are confident that we've tested that entire input space. Dialogue 18.0 also leads us to um, ask a few supplemental questions as well. So, as is hopefully well known to everybody here, some of the performance improvements that were in Dialogue 18.0, we removed in 18.2 as a precaution because it was later reported to us that some of the it was incorrectly, sometimes incorrectly calculating results. So we have two important questions. How do we go about the process of reintroducing those performance enhancements, and should we even uh, reintroduce those? Right. So my work today, and what I'm going to talk to you about, is answering those questions. So it's a good opportunity to step back and evaluate the primitive as a whole because I'm already going to be um, trying to answer questions about specific performance enhancements. Right, now, there's no easy way to make graphs more interesting. Right? And, and as a former theoretical physicist, I don't believe in fun anyway, so you're just going to have to bear this. <laughs> One of the simplest questions we can ask is, was Dialogue 18.0 faster than 18.2? Now, 18.2 uh, is more closely performant to 17.1 because we removed some of the performance enhancements in 18.0. So theoretically, 18.0 should be the fastest version of the interpreter, and 18.2 is the latest one. Uh, we are performing this membership operation here, 
Uh, this x here is a lie because we're varying x, the size of x. That's the left-hand argument to this membership operation. Uh, y we're keeping constant and we're populating both with uh, random integer values. Now, I hope that's not too quick for everybody. Has everyone got that? Uh, right, 18.0 is in the red. That's the higher curve if you have a difficulty seeing. And 18.2 is the blue curve on the bottom. So, uh, and this is the total time elapsed in milliseconds. So here, 18.0, at least for these particular inputs, is slower than 18.2. Now, you would have seen some, of, uh, some evidence of that in Velimati's presentation earlier. Uh, I can confirm that he's not wrong. Right, another, another example. Uh, another membership operation, uh, slightly different inputs. Uh, again, random. You don't really need to concentrate on what these inputs are. This time we're varying the right-hand argument to the membership operation. So we're taking some constant set, we're asking uh, the, the amount of execution time it takes to um, uh, run on a variable right-hand set. This time, 18.0, again in red, that's the bottom curve here, is faster than 18.2, which is the blue curve, which is the higher curve here. So that's the good thing. However, clearly there's something interesting going on. All right, let's single out 18.0. What's going on here is that there are three different algorithms being invoked by the interpreter. The first one, now I hope I'm not blocking anyone's view. So I hope, people, can people see that there's a short red stubby line here, right? That's algorithm number one. That's a small set optimization that's kicking in. Then we have algorithm number two, the one that's exhibiting these spikes. And finally, algorithm number three kicks in uh, and the execution times drop after about set size 2000 onwards. Now, what's going on with these spikes is, is what the interpreter is trying to do is it's creating a hash table. So it's taking elements in the set Y, it's computing a hash and storing those in a table. So if we take one of these spikes here, the interpreter has decided it wants to create a, uh, a hash table that's, uh, let's see, what would that be? Probably 2048 size. And as, the, as, the, as more elements it needs to hash, more and more of them are colliding. So it has to spend more time trying to resolve that situation. And eventually it hits a boundary point and it bumps the size of the hash tables up so there's a drop in execution time. Okay. Third algorithm is a, a lookup table. So it doesn't try to hash the entries. It simply stores them as uh, memory addresses. Again, you don't need to know the details. Right, so if this is a problem, let's try and think, uh, what's the dumb way of trying to solve this? Well, the dumb way to do it is just to increase the size of the hash table. So that's the blue line here. So here, the hash tables, this is, this is an adjustment of the interpreter that I've made where the hash tables are eight times the size. And we can see that, yes, it does alleviate the issue. There are still some collisions probably occurring here. But that's a lot better than, than this spiking behavior. Right? However, there's a more fundamental problem here, which is that our intuition tells us that if the interpreter can execute something this fast for larger set sizes, it should be able to do it for the smaller set sizes as well. We could, for example, just artificial, we can add artificial elements to the set, invoke the third opera and just throw them away. Right? This is a problem of algorithm selection. So here, the problem with the interpreter is, is it should be running algorithm three throughout algorithm three throughout this entire domain. That's the green line here. And if you notice, I'll get out of the way again, it's faster than our previous small set opt optimization. Right? So, so this is something where an assumption of the past has been invalidated. Somewhere in the past, we had an assumption that this is the fastest algorithm. And that's been invalidated by the 18.0 work here. Right? Uh, is that clear to everybody? Okay, good. 
Right. Uh, this is just the more fancy plot of the previous one. Uh, now I'm varying the left argument size as well. So uh, right argument size on the x-axis, that's the same right argument size. Uh, I haven't gone all the way. And now the left argument is also being varied. So the previous plot is, if you imagine taking a horizontal slice of this one and uh, let's see. Um, again, you can see the, um, the issue with the hash collision occurring here. Now, so far the plots that I've showed are, are of membership, and everything that you'll see after this point is also of membership. But I don't want to give the impression that um, I'm only talking about membership here. If you see problems that I'm going to be showing you now, they will probably also apply to index of and the other set operations as well. So don't go thinking you're out of the woods just because you're not using them. Uh, yeah, so index of same plot as last time, also showing the hash collision. That's just making that point. Right, okay. Ah, okay, good. Uh, let's go back two steps. Um, this particular, right, so if we take any data point here, what we're asking for is, is, uh, this, is this is left argument. So left argument is set, um, okay, also, when I say set, here I just mean rank one array of simple array. Okay, I'm going to be using those terms interchangeably. So we have something which is a large set size, membership of something which is a small set size. Right, so we're asking, we've got many different elements, and we want to know whether they are members of some small target set. Now, can I open this question up to the room? Does anybody work with data like that? Does anybody know? Yes, no, maybe? You do sometimes. OK, OK. Well, I just want to know whether you're in this regime, because this is, my prejudice is that this is atypical. Usually, you have something which is small, and you're asking whether it's a member of some large target set. I want to know whether you, anyone deals with data that's the other way around. OK, so we do have some. OK, good. That's good to know. Um, I'll get back to this point later on. This plot here is just with the situation reversed, so a little bit more normal. Uh, left argument, something which is small size, membership, something which is large size. Okay? And again, here we see evidence of hash collision. Okay? Right. Okay, next. All right, we're about halfway through. Right. Any sensible person would probably stop here. Uh, I'm not sensible. So I'm going to continue. Um, the plots that follow are some plots that I've generated that compare 18.0 and 18.2. Things where I have seen odd behavior happening and which I can't explain. But it's just to give you an impression of the sorts of things that I've seen and I will, I will be working on. So let's spend five, ten minutes just going through them very quickly. Right. All of these will be membership, as I said before. 18.0 will always be the left plot. 18.2 will always be the right-hand plot. We'll be varying the left argument of membership on the x-axis and varying the right argument to membership on the y-axis. Okay? 18.2, we can see, again, exhibiting hash collisions, so not ideal. 18.0, it's not showing hash collisions in this domain of this plot, right? But it is over here. So we can, well, not, no, not hash collisions. It is slower here in this region of the plot. So again, we're being forced to conclude that 18.0, sometimes it's an improvement over its previous versions, and sometimes it's a regression in performance. OK. Uh, this uh, right-hand set goes 1 to 1,000. This 0 is a lie. Um, now we can increase the set sizes. We're going from 1,000 to 10,000. Now, 18.2 looks a little bit more normal. There is a spike in execution here. Don't worry, we'll come back to that one. 18.2, well, 18.0, uh, doing that, whatever that is. Um, OK, again, looks like there's areas where it's performing better than 18.2, perhaps. Certainly areas where it's doing worse. And this I can't yet explain. 
back to this spike here. Um, this goes from one to a thousand. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go one to a hundred so that we zoom into this triangle. Okay. So there we go. Again, similar story to before with 18.2. This is a problem of algorithm selection. So there's a small set optimization which is kicking in here. You can see that a little bit more clearly on 18.0. I'll get out of people's way. Um, this spike here, what the interpreter is trying to do there is it's trying to determine whether it can execute a particular algorithm. And in order to do that, it's doing a scan through the whole array. It, it then concludes that it can't use that algorithm, and then it falls to a fallback algorithm instead. So, so that's possibly we can do better there. We can, we can have a smarter choice of how it's selecting its algorithm. 18.0 uh, doesn't seem to show that behavior. Uh, we're going to increase the sizes of the arguments again. This time, 18.2 looks kind of normal. Ah, and I should mention, when I say normal, I am not considering at the moment the time complexity of the algorithms. Okay? So I don't, at this stage, particularly care whether it's bilinear in its arguments or logarithmic or whatever. If you are interested in that sort of stuff, then I would suggest going to Aaron's uh, workshop tomorrow. You will, you will hear more about that sort of stuff. 18.0, it looks like it's performing well here, but again, I can't explain this behavior yet. Ah, I should have mentioned as well. Um, these are all being populated by um, random two-byte variables, um, uniformly random. So um, these could well. I'll, how long have I got left? How do we how do we explain what's going on here? Well, it could be it could be a caching issue. It could perhaps be an artifact of the measuring process. I don't believe it is, just because of the way that I generate these plots. Um, it could be just what we saw earlier on with the, um, the schematic of the different algorithms, although I haven't quite matched this to what it claims it's doing. So, so don't ask me about this, not yet anyway. Right, what have we got left? Okay. Bigger, bigger integer values now. So this time we, um, we're going back to normal set sizes with bigger integer values. 18.2, now this is interesting. Uh, I can't explain that either. Uh, the algorithm, what I can tell you is that the, the algorithm in this regime is the same as in here. So something to do with the way it's hashing these particular value or for set sizes of this order of magnitude. It seems to be something odd. 18.0 um, hash collisions, and again, kind of the same profile as we've been seeing before. But here, if there's one thing to note, it's the scale. So 18.0 order of execution, about 0 0.1 milliseconds, whereas in 18.2, let's say one millisecond. So order of magnitude difference here. Uh, that's a little bit easier to see if I scale up 18.2 to the same uh, scale, right? Uh, another plot here. Um, again, 18.2 a lot slower than 18.0. So here we see evidence that 18.0, at least for at least for this data, is performing a lot faster than uh, than 18.2 and 17.1 before it. Uh, let's see. Again, same story. Um, 18.2 seems to be a lot slower than 18.0. Again, behavior that I can't yet explain. Um, right, now, uh, the nature of my talk is I've been pointing out things that don't make any sense. So I don't want you to have the impression that 18.2 is bonkers or 18.0 and, or 18 .0 is bonkers and 18.2 also has problems. There's m the entire domain space is enormous, and most of the time it's doing some things that are sensible. So here, 18.2 doing something sensible, 18.0 probably doing something sensible, uh, orders of magnitude faster as well. 
And again, a similar plot here, 18.2 hash collisions, but 18.0, again, a lot faster. These are for small integer values. Okay, uh, let's see. Yeah, it's much the same plot again. 18.0 uh, and 18.2 performing reasonably sensibly by the looks of things. Um, uh, and 18.0 a lot faster than 18.2. Okay, that's the end of the boring graphs. Now you've got boring <laughs> procedural talk. Right, what can you conclude from all of this? The first thing is, is what I've put up on here on the screen. That determining what the performance profile of any primitive is, is a difficult task. Effectively, probably impossible because the input space is too big. We've got the set sizes that we need to vary over. We've got the actual data itself that we have to vary over. And I don't know what data people out in the real world are using. I don't know if it um, spans different orders of magnitude. I don't know if it's normally distributed, whether it's uniformly distributed. And so it's a very difficult task to know exactly how the primitives are performing. However, doing some of the plots that I've shown you today is instructive. It can, it can spot problems. Uh, it can give us an idea of how the primitive is performing. So let's go back to uh, the questions I asked earlier on about 18.0. My job is going to be looking at, looking at plots like this, looking at the code, looking at the algorithms in order to, de in order to determine which of 18.0's algorithms can go or performance enhancements can go back into 18.2. And also fixing up any problems in the performance of the primitive that I've outlined today, something like the hash collision issue. And so we've come up with a um, couple of guidelines for how this procedure is gonna work. So first of all, the performance enhancement has to be significant. So it has to be at least, well, it's a guideline, it has to be twice as fast as it was previously. So an order of magnitude base two, likely to be useful to the user. So there's no point us wasting our time trying to optimize some niche corner of the domain space where nobody is working in. So we do want to concentrate our work on, um, the, on, the, on the sorts of data that is gonna be useful to real, real world users. And finally, adequately tested. And uh, I hope some of my plots shows the, the work that I'll be doing along those lines. Right, so how long have we got left? Uh, about seven, six, six, seven minutes. Okay, good, this is the final slide, so don't worry. Back to the previous point where I said um, likely to be useful to the user. I said I don't know anything at all about the data that you're using. So it would be really helpful for me to know the types of data that you're working with, integers, floats, how it's distributed, the size of the sets, properties of the data. We do have a plan at some point in the future to produce an instrumented version of the interpreter, something that can gather statistics and, and you can feed that back to me. And that will help inform my work, telling me, first of all, where to concentrate, where to prioritize our performance work, and also, how to perhaps do some of the tuning that's involved in this performance work. Um, so, uh, and also which algorithms might have been hit, which algorithms which we might include, whether they would be hit, um, possibly timing statistics as well. Um, that's all to be finalized, but it would really help us if we had volunteers to run that instrumented version of the interpreter. Uh, and I think I'm about bang on time, so, yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carter. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>